Father, cleanse these filthy hands. I long for brokenness for all my sin and shame. The tears you wept down number the sands. With every sin. All right, so two years ago when we came to uh, Northern Texas area, our first spot preaching was here at the, uh, I think this is uh, Fair, Fair, Fairfield Park, and um, it was at a gay uh, pride type rally event, and it was something that we uh, wanted to do. Obviously, it was... Uh, something that the Lord had put on our heart and so we made preparations to do that and before we came out of here we were in prayer we were praying that God would bring people across our paths that were like-minded that wanted to serve the Lord and get the gospel out to a dying world and so the night before in preparation we ended up getting no sleep so there was a lot of opposition that was coming against us the enemy obviously didn't want us out here we had no sleep, but the preparation was already done, so we ended up coming out here anyways. And I made the comment on camera, when I am weak, I am strong, because it is Christ that I am uh, uh, relying upon, and it indeed is Jesus Christ, because he gave us the strength to come out here and preach with practically no sleep. I think we had uh, uh, zero hours that day, so we were running on fumes. And it was that day when we were preaching here at that event that we came across Brother John, Brother Spencer, and um, that was an answered prayer. So that was two years ago today. Now, for the Lord's will and His plan, we're going to be moving to Indiana, so this is the last time that we're going to be preaching with uh, Brother John, uh, at least here in the state of Texas, uh, while living here. It's not to say that we may not come back, Lord willing, we will. But uh, it's an honor and a privilege to serve with these brothers in Christ that we met while uh, living here in Texas. And we glorify God for that. We're very thankful for that. God is good. Praise His name. Give Him glory in all things because He is worth it. So we want to carry that on when we move to Indiana. Brother John, I know you're watching this. We love you. God bless you, Brother Spencer, if you're seeing this, we love you, God bless you. And all of you brothers there that we had an opportunity to meet with, all of you here in Texas are an answer prayer. Brother Gabriel, Brother Ryan, uh, Brother Jeffrey, Brother Richard, we're very thankful. Anyone that I left out, um, we're very grateful that um, you have come across our lives and we've come across yours and we glorify God for you. We love you, God bless you, and all that you do.
So I want to continue on with those who may be professing Christians or no, but simply don't know who Jesus is. I want to ask you this. Is Jesus Christ your goal? Is he your goal? Amen. points on this. It says this, that a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask that you have me excuse. And another said, I have bought five yokes of oxen, and I am going to test them. I too also ask that you have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. So I want to point out here that many of us today, when we hear the call, the invitation from Jesus Christ, to live by faith, we make the excuse for the things of this world. We say, well, I have a house, I have a car. I have uh, so many other things, I'm married, I cannot attend to this call right now. Please have me excused. So just like those in this parable, we too can find ourselves in that very predicament. But my friends, let me tell you this. Each one of us will die, and we don't know when that day is coming. And if you die without Christ, there is hell to pay. Let's continue on. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded. And still there is room. There still is plenty of room in the kingdom of God. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Folks, that is exactly what we are doing here today. We are going out into the highways and hedges to compel you to come into the kingdom of God. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Because those that were invited made excuses. There were other things that were more important to them than the very invitation which God had sent to them. That invitation for us today is through Jesus Christ the righteous. It is through Him that we are invited to have fellowship with the Father in reconciliation through the precious blood of the Lamb. See, many who were invited in this parable that Jesus gave would not commit to Christ and they made excuses on why they would not come. So many today make the same excuses and yet profess faith in Christ. While they live still in sin and according to their own way, instead of a life fully devoted to Jesus Christ. Think back to Christ rejecting Israel during the time of Christ upon this earth. The Jews then, much like now, claimed to be serving God and believed they were saved because of their law-keeping works and their lineage linked to Abraham. They rejected any call of faith to commit to Christ. 
because they have the law of Moses and Abraham as their father. We can see this playing out in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 33. Jesus said this, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But the Jews, as an example, said we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? They did not understand that indeed they were in bondage to their sin. There was no possible way that they could work their way to salvation, for salvation is not by the work of man. Jesus answered them, these Jews who said we have Abraham as our father, who said that we have never been in bondage to anyone, who said, how can you say you will be made free? The response of Jesus Christ was this, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So in using Christ, rejecting Jews during the times of Christ, as an example, you too may say that you know Jesus Christ and even claim to believe in Jesus Christ, but if you are not His disciples, then you are not truly committed to Him. My friends, I say this as a loving warning. We're not out here hating you. We're sharing the truth and love that we do need to be fully focused on Him, fully committed to Jesus, trusting in Him alone, not in ourselves, but in Him, as He works in us and changes us, as my brother John has already mentioned. You see, the Pharisees were legalists who depended on the law and their genealogy for salvation, and the Bible has much to say about them. But there is also a very real danger which is present in this modern age to make excuses for ourselves while we walk in self-deception, claiming to be saved by faith. That is a fake faith which cannot save. An example of this is given by Paul in Philippians 3 where he talks of those who claim to know Jesus Christ but they themselves are led by their own bellies. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 verses 17 through 19 the following, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul is saying, look to us. Look how we walk. We are so fortunate today to be able to read the epistles of Paul. We can see through the Word of God, that is the Bible, exactly how he walked, how he uh, went on about his ministry, the compassion that he had for others. He was willing to go even in the face of persecution to bring the gospel of Christ to the Jews and then on to the Gentiles after they rejected it. Here's what Paul continues on to say in Philippians chapter 3. For many walk of whom I have told you often and I'll tell you even weeping. See, Paul is weeping for those who ultimately end up walking in their own direction, not being led by the Holy Spirit. These are not disciples of Christ, yet they may claim to be. He says this, even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. These are those who would rather serve self 
than others who have a profession of love, but that love is merely tongue and cheek rather than done in deed and in truth. Do not make excuses to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Christ. For a mere profession of Christ to born of true biblical love for God and others is absent of life. I want to say that one more time. For a mere profession of Christ, devoid of true biblical love for God and others is absent of life. Consider the cross and what it means before professing faith and belief in Jesus Christ. And after you have considered it, commit to that faith being rooted firmly in Christ as your strength and do not depart from that belief. Understand that all that Christ has done for you is true. All that he has said is true. And he is indeed one day coming back to receive to him his own. Hebrews 3.14 says this, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence and fast to the end. This is exactly what Jesus will go on to illustrate in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. But first, the parable of the Great Supper continued after from those who made excuses in Luke 14, 21. For the Master, that is God, commanded the servant to go out into the streets and lanes of the cities in order to bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. That is God, after being rejected by men living in the pride of life, then sent the invite out to those who would be broken, humbled, and poor in spirit upon the hearing of the gospel message. Those who would look to Jesus Christ, just as Simon Peter did in John 6, after many of Jesus' own disciples turned away from him, because they became offended by Jesus. Yet Peter, Simon, after Jesus Christ asked them in John 6, 67, do you also want to go away? Said in verses 68 through 69, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son, of the living God. Simon Peter faith in what Jesus said in John 6, 63, where Jesus said, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Amen. Glorify Jesus for he is who he said he is. So Simon Peter and those disciples with him are like the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, in that they were humbled by Jesus and have a poor spirit as they recognize Jesus as the only source of true life. They were also the servants called to go out into the streets and lanes of the cities in order to compel all to come in. Jesus will demonstrate that this is our call for us who believe in Him, that we are to abide in Him and do just as His servants did through compelling others to come into the kingdom of God through the hearing and believing of the gospel message and then to walk in obedience and abide in Jesus Christ. Jesus went on to illustrate after the parable of the Great Supper our call to leave all in order to follow Him. The question is this to you, are you willing to leave this world behind in order to follow Jesus Christ? Or are you in love with the world? 
Not that it's a bad thing to go out and enjoy the fair and to have joy in life. But the question is, is do you love the world more than you love Jesus Christ? Who is it that you bow the knee to? That's what I'm asking you now. <clears throat> In Luke 14, verses 25 through 26, he said to the great multitudes that were with him, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What does he mean by this? Jesus is telling us here that our relationships are far less important than faithfulness and obedience to Him that is Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now here's what Napoleon himself understood concerning this principle according to uh, David Gusick, and he's quoted as saying the following. Napoleon said this, I know men and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there was no possible term of comparison. Alexander the Great, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires, Napoleon said. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force, he says. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and this hour millions of men would die for him. Amen, and glorify the name of Jesus Christ, for he is love, he is the expression of it, and that has been, been made known to all creation. The question we must ask ourselves is this. Am I willing to be faithful to Christ over any relationships I have? In comparison to Christ, would my relationship to Him be so strong that others could say I hate them in comparison? Am I willing to die for Christ, fully trusting in Him, knowing that His words are life? Do you fully trust in Jesus Christ and do you reckon in the pits of your heart, in the depth of your heart, that His words are, in fact, life? Do you believe that the words of Jesus, that they are spirit and they are life, are you willing to lay a hold of heaven? That's the question. Jesus went on to say in Luke 14 27 and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple this is more than accepting an invitation a mere profession of faith this is a lifelong commitment to Jesus Christ and that we would lose our life now in this world both figuratively and even maybe literally speaking, depending on the circumstances, so that we would gain a new life in Christ and an eternity to come. But the work rests upon Jesus Christ. He made the way. He's the one who has done it. So we glorify His name in exactly that and in all things. See, Jesus was saying something very similar. So what he already said in Luke 9, 23, where he said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So he's saying something very similar to what we just read in Luke 14 and Luke 9, 23. This is a repeated statement. This means that to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ is like a person figuratively carrying his cross to crucifixion 
just as Jesus Christ himself physically did. You see, in the Roman world, before a man died on a cross, he had to carry his cross or at least the horizontal beam of the cross to the place of execution. When the Romans crucified a criminal, they didn't just hang them on a cross, they first hung a cross on him. Carrying a cross always led to death on a cross. So when you picked up your cross and you carried it to the place of execution, it always led to death. That was the finality of that action. No one carried a cross for fun. The first hearers of Jesus didn't need an explanation of the cross. They knew that it was an unrelenting instrument of torture, death, and humiliation. If someone took up his cross, he never came back. It was a one-way journey. Please hear what I'm saying here. When you take up your cross, it's a one-way journey. When you truly believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is a one-way trip. You must reckon yourself as crucified with Christ, that it is no longer you who lives, but Jesus Christ in you. As you submit to Him over your flesh in true loving obedience, and in doing so, you will find that His yoke is easy and His burden is light because He walks right beside you, strengthening you along the way. Jesus Christ is worth it. He is worth everything we have and everything we are. The invite is to lay all that you are are at the foot of the cross and to believe that he died and rose again on the third day and if you really believe this you will live for him jesus illustrated this point further as he continued on in luke 14 verses 28 through 33 and he where he gives uh excuse me the parable of the tower here's what he says for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? This is Christ speaking here. Whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first to consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for condition of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Those are the words of Christ. What does he mean? obedience and abiding faith is commanded here if we are to apply this parable and count the cost of discipleship lest we come short that is consider what it means to follow jesus christ anyone who has ever been baptized as an example ought to understand that we have been crucified with our lord and savior buried and risen to newness of life if you have an understanding of what baptism itself means. We have been born again, no longer to walk in the deadness of sin, but in righteousness and peace with Him. It is not that you have to clean yourself up on your own before coming to Christ, but instead it is that you come to Christ and you cooperate with Him as He works in you to clean you up as you bear the fruit of true repentance and walk in faith towards Him who has called you out from this world to be a vessel of honor fit for His good use, allowing God to use you to bring the light of the gospel to this dark and dying world. Anyone who does not love his brother 
or sister enough to give him or her the light of the gospel which brings everlasting life does not truly love God. So if you're a professing Christian, I would ask for you to simply examine yourselves. Ask yourself, are you willing to share the gospel with your neighbors? Are you willing to share the gospel with your friends? Or are you ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ? Are you ashamed to make mention of Him? Jesus very clearly said, if you are ashamed of me and my words in this wicked and adulterous generation, I will be ashamed of you when I come back with my Father and the holy angels. Please, trust in Him. First John 4.20 verse 21 as well says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. For how can we say we love God while people die every day and step into the eternal flames of hell where well, there is no chance for repentance? You see, eternity is final and God's heart is for the lost. So too must be the disciples of Christ. If you are a disciple of Christ and your Father's heart is for the lost, then you need to take up His will, put down your will, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and live for God instead of living for self. I'll say it again. It is appointed for man to die once, and then comes judgment according to the book of Hebrews. Folks, get into the living Word of God because it is so important that we understand the truth as opposed to what the world puts out. In an example of obedience in Daniel 11.32, it says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. So here in Daniel 11, when Antiochus Epiphanes turned on Jerusalem, the Jewish people were divided. Some forsook their covenant with God and embraced Greek culture. Those who knew their God made a stand for righteousness in the face of incredible persecution. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, we see the command not to love the world and instead to take up the will of God as agrees with what we read in Luke 14. Here's what it says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Please reflect on this, my friends. The heart of God is for you, that you would turn to Him, that you would seek first the kingdom of God, trust in Him. Don't worry about the things of this life, for He will provide for you.
Jesus also said in Matthew 12, 50, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This was in response to one who told Jesus that his mother and brothers were waiting to speak with him. The point here is that you can have a relationship with Christ. It is done through faith. And in that faith, God works in you. You will then serve Jesus Christ and take up the will of the Father through faith as God works in you. The call is to be a vessel of honor fit for God's good use. Are you willing to do that though? That's the question. That is the question. Do we really want to serve God as vessels of honor, loving Him more than any relationship we have with our father, our mother, our brothers, sisters, friends? Are you willing to take a stand and present the gospel of Christ in the face of ridicule when people turn their backs on you and they say all manner of evil things against you, falsely speaking of you just like they did of the prophets and the servants of old? Are you willing to take a stand for Christ and to present the love of Him who spilt His holy, precious blood on your behalf? knowing that every man will give an account to Jesus Christ on that day. It is prophesied that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I pray that you acknowledge that now, here today, for today, as my brother John said, is the day of salvation. Don't put off what you can do today until tomorrow for tomorrow is not promised. The Lord loves you and He demonstrated that by dying for you on the cross. This message is so important that He sends out street preachers just like us to communicate that message to you. I don't believe that it's any coincidence that we are here or that you are here. We are walking in obedience to the call because Jesus Christ loves you and his desires for the lost once again. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. We see that a true follower of Jesus Christ must be about His Father's will on this earth. In Luke 14, 34-35, Jesus said this at the end of Luke chapter 14, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The call for all who would be named a Christian is to depart from evil as well, according to 2 Timothy 2.19. To be a light for Christ as we walk in the Spirit, putting on love for one another, which can only be done by abiding in Jesus Christ. Finally, Jesus said this in John chapter 15, verses 4.11. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus said that I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they are gathered, and they gather them, excuse me, and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, Jesus says, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done 
for you. Now this doesn't mean that we are to walk in the desires of the world. The Lord is saying that as you take up the will of the Father, His desires become your desires. You put down the flesh and walk in the Spirit as the Holy Spirit makes the circumcision done, made without hands in your heart. You no longer seek the things to please the flesh, but instead you seek to serve Him who is God our Creator. He says this in continuing on, If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be My disciples. And I want to finish out here with a few more scriptures to point out. Romans 8, verses 1 through 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His only Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Praise Jesus. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. First John 1, verses 5-7 through 7 says, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you. Testing. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. First John 2, verses 3 through 6 says, Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him, and by this we know that we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Again, the book of 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. Our obedience is not according to the letter of the law, that is by the works of the law, but instead by the Spirit, for it is, once again, the Holy Spirit that gives life. And those who have the Spirit will show forth the fruit of the Spirit. Pay attention. This is the commandments from God that applies to the church that we walk in the Spirit. 2 Corinthians, verses, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 through 6. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, 
but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It is the Holy Spirit that gives life, the spirit of the law. The morality is what guides us, walking in love. What else does the Word say on this? Galatians 5, 22-23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Paul reiterates this point. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother, God bless you, Jesus Christ, is number one, just as you said. Thank you for showing that finger to our children. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. That is the fruit of of the flesh. That is the fruit of walking in darkness and hatred towards your brother. This is why the Bible says you must be born again. Romans 10 verses 10 through 13 says this. After hearing all this, hearing the message of the gospel, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture says, whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And for us who have this hope in Christ, Paul says in Romans 8, for we, <clears throat> for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, for we were saved in this hope. Amen. But a hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Glorify God in all that you do. Trust in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For He died for you. His call is for you. The Bible says that He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that all would come to repentance. Oh, that's what we want. That's what we're here for. Satan deceives. The Bible says that he is a liar and a thief. He's only come to kill and to destroy. Do not put your trust in Him. Turn, repent, turn to the Lord your God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. There is no other door. 
There is no other path. There is no other plan for salvation. It is found only in Jesus Christ. If anyone desires to come and talk with us, if you desire prayer requests, we're more than happy to pray, more than happy to speak to you, to listen. We're not here just to speak. If you want to come and talk, we do have ears. We love you enough to do just that. God bless you all. May you all find peace in Jesus Christ.